Thank you so much. It's, I just want to say for myself, I'm the host. I, just to introduce myself, who I haven't conversed with in a moment, I'm uh, Rufus Pollock. I'm getting to host tonight. I am one of the co-founders of uh, Life Itself and been uh, also involved uh, in, in at least in a very interesting this topic for a long time. And it's really what I just want to, really want to thank people for coming, but also sharing. It's so uh, fascinating and, and inspiring, actually, to hear when people come and what your backgrounds are and why you're interested in this topic. It, because it's not there yet. It's not as common as it should be, uh, this kind of interest. So it's really inspiring to hear from people or in all kinds of time zones. And I think Christina gets the, uh, the award for up earliest uh, today. So uh, on, on this, not, not too early, fortunately. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Boaz my, uh, here to present a little bit about the project, and then we're going to have a, a discussion. Uh, please feel free to ask questions, I think, as we go along. I mean, Boaz, you sure. can set that. And I'm going to get to dialogue a bit as well. It's going to be a more yeah. interactive thing. So yeah, over, over to you. Sounds great. Thank you, Rufus. And it's an honor to have you with us on this community call. Um, and uh, also to be with uh, you, Catherine and Matthew. We've been working on this for several months. And I look forward also to your uh, contributions. So I'll be inviting you in to share your respective parts in relationship to the different organizations that we came to explore and analyze a little bit and see how they fit with how we consider uh, a developmental approach. Um, so uh, just to say, we're both based uh, close to Bergerac in France right now. Um, this is where Rufus lives. And um, yeah, part of this Life Itself Research um, Lab, Life Itself Research, which is actually looking to um, understand what we mean by development, looking to understand also the, the, the types of spaces that are already present in the world. Um, and this is what this project is really about, is uh, trying to map out uh, organizations, institutions, schools in North America, in Europe, um, that uh, weave together a certain number of principles that we then define as a deliberately developmental approach. And, you know, we're really very much at the beginning of understanding what this means, what this approach is, especially as we look at it from a place of education, from a place of personal growth and, and, and also contribution to how these approaches can help to strengthen and make our societies more resilient. Um, so I look forward very much to a discussion tonight um, with Rufus and all of us together so that perhaps we can go further in understanding what we mean by a deliberately developmental approach, if even those terms are appropriate. Um, so, you know, any other terms, particularly an, an analysis of language, uh, is something that we've paid close attention to, um, because maybe there are many organizations that are already in this space, but that use different language and therefore wouldn't necessarily be identified. Um, so if you have other terminology that, you know, is relevant, please feel free to share it later. And if you have other organizations that, you know, have really like ring bells for you in terms of uh, fitting into a criteria... Um, that I'll describe in a few moments, then also feel free to share it. We're open up, um, happy to explore and expand a little da database, um, which is actually a little project that we're thinking about um, possibly doing later on is um, bringing all this information on the web and having an interactive opportunity for you to be able to include more organizations. Um, so we're looking to also in this project, um, using our technical term now to coalesce uh, the existing developmental spaces that we have and how we can deepen this field uh, together further. Because as Rufus mentioned, there's still um, very few people and places that are actually implementing these approaches. Okay, so what do we mean by developmental? Um, let's uh, let's uh, have a little crowd sourcing uh, for a couple of moments. When I say the word developmental, what are the first associations that come to you, if you write in the chat or if you want to open up your mic, what's the what's what's a, like maybe a word or two words that come to you in your mind when you write when you when you hear the word developmental? I would probably say to start off learning. Mm -hmm. Learning, yeah. 
Mitra, you got enabling conditions for unfoldment. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. Christina, transformation and maturation. Mm -hmm. Child and adult, Simon. Les, uh, your mic was off, so we couldn't hear you. Um, oh, you can hear me thinking if you focus. Um, I, I was just thinking on the systems, a systems approach, but also that, that the, the core concepts are not yet, they're not determined. So it is a very open, mm -hmm. inclusive process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So an open-ended process and something that uh, has sort of a, 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 a momentum, a growth to it. Yeah, to it. Very good. And Lisa, you write differentiation between individual and community development. Yeah, so when you say di differentiation, maybe that there are these two uh, ways of developing, developing individually and, and, and in society. Do you want to say more about that? Yeah. Yeah, so that there is exactly that there are these two that are interlinked. So it's it's the same and yet it's different and separate. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they're interdependent and they're also differentiated. Um, so what you do on yourself influences the whole or society and how you develop society influences the individual. Um, and uh, maybe that's connected to what you're sharing, Simon, around the ideas of development and how these preconceptions then influence the process of development as well. So, you know, things about the conceptual framework or the maps um, that we have, the terms that we use, obviously, are really important. I know you're a really great scholar and uh, interested um, expert in relationship to this particular area. Great, and then Keegan and Leahy. Yeah, thank you, Mitra. You're bringing in some of the grandfathers in a way, um, definitely you know, important folks that we've also read a little bit about and um, did some background research before we ended, we, we engaged in this process. So I think all of the aspects that you mentioned there are relevant. Um, so Simon, specifically in terms of the population, we looked at youth, 15 to 25. Um, so sort of ending high school and then young adults uh, going into the professional uh, professional domain. Um, and I think indeed, you know, really looking at what kind of uh, conditions the organizations are offering for the individuals to transform and mature. And Christina, so I think your terms are really, really appropriate. Um, and uh, those conditions for unfoldment, as you say, Mitra. And at the same time, it's a particular type of transformation, a particular type of maturation and unfoldment that we're looking for in terms of these organizations where um, we're looking for them to support a growth in terms of connecting to oneself. So a developmental approach is really inclusive of an internal emotional awareness, maybe even somatic awareness, a sense of uh, being able to connect to one's inner experience in with relative ease, with relative um, capability. And that, of course, you know, then being connected to maybe your intuition, to developing wisdom, to be able to connect to a sense of art. I mean, there's all sorts of other things that unfold and connect to this more primary quality of connecting to your inner experience. Um, so it's a type of maturation, a type of transformation that supports people and youth in this case to deepen their ability to be with emotions, to be to deepen their ability to understand their sense of self, to be able to really be able to um, feel more confident, feel more clear as to what their sense of self is, how it arises, and um, perhaps even in later stages have some sense of playfulness and enjoyment about who they are. Um, a sense of deep grounding in what we could perhaps use as a term as a, in a spiritual way, right? So that's, you know, we'll get into the later parts of the presentation in terms of the use of that term, which is maybe in some circles not so appropriate, but in others actually really right on. Um, so we look forward to hearing your reactions and, you know, comments to the different use of linguistics. Um, so maybe I'll shift now to the presentation itself for a few minutes. Um, which uh, Matthew has brilliantly prepared for us. Um, so I'll start it off and then uh, we'll, um, we'll share a little bit about the organizations 
all together. Um, so do you see this? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so this is a project that we we were working uh, in, in collaboration with partners of uh, Fetzer Institute and Commonweal in the US and Lascaret, which is a foundation in Sweden. Um, you probably know uh, as you just went to the conference and um, then of course, life itself. And one of the aims of this project, as mentioned, is to try to actually sow a field um, to bring together perhaps many different types of organizations that we may not have associated uh, in similar ways before through this project. Um, and not just in terms of studying the ways in which they're developmental, but actually actively then trying to engage. And um, this is why, for example, we're proposing this meeting today. We'll have another meeting on Monday, which you're invited and joined to, to, to which, you, which we may we may be in, um, inviting you to. We're still thinking about it internally. Um, but the aim is to create a platform upon which all these organizations can, can connect together. Um, and so we have a threefold criteria, um, criteria around to what extent is the organization helping to develop a whole person approach? Um, so primarily, again, you know, supporting individuals to connect internally, to be able to get to find out about their sense of self, and also find out and develop competencies in different areas of their sense of self. So let's just... Uh, inquiring in, 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 our, in our collective here, when you went to school, we all went to school, most probably, because that's not an optional option thing. Um, what's one way in which you developed when you were in school? What was, what was the thing that was asked to, for you to study? What did, what, did, what did you learn in school? If there was just one thing or the main thing, what would that be? Let's hear it from you. Knowledge. Knowledge, yeah. You'd agree, Simon? Yeah, okay. Just very much the intellect, end of. <laughs> exactly, the intellect, right? So through academic study, through sort of what other people have known, and that's one type of learning, but we're not gonna learn very much, or maybe we learn certain, certain things, but um, certainly not many other things about who we are and how we experience the world through academic knowledge. Um, so one of the, one of the things that we're looking at in terms of whole person is, uh, to be able to have more, uh, education around emotions, education around how our body reacts to stress, for example, you know, we may, I wish I had a, a class around how I can regulate my nervous system when, you know, I get high on arousal and how to then, you know, use that skill to be in relationship in a skillful way. But I'm like 99% sure none of us learned this at school. And so, you know, as a developmental approach, we would expect that there would be some of these uh, learnings. Um, a link to society. Um, so to what extent is the development of myself and my capacity related to the society? So most of us, in terms of how our, most of our education is shaped is for us to become productive economic agents, right? So we can have a, a certain um, profession, a certain competence, and then we can produce certain things, we can be a part of society. But to what extent have we learned or been, been inquired around what is our role in society? Or what kind of belonging do we feel in this planet or in this society? What kind of ways do we relate to society, what? Why would we want to engage in society? You now, these are the types of questions that we're looking to see in, 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 to make the link between our personal development and how that links to uh, society. So there's a sense of meaning. This is a sense of purpose. A sense of um, uh, acting also larger, larger than self. Um, and so we'll we'll describe some organizations that do that fairly well. And then finally, societal practice, um, and that's related to actually how much scaffolding, how, mu how much uh, support is there in the institutions to enable us as individuals to be able to integrate society, to be able to actually engage and transform society in a way that's quite practical, that's quite pragmatic. Um, and because one of the things that we found through, the, through our search is that 
even though you know certain organizations talk about like uh, transforming ourselves to transform society actually sometimes it's there's very little pragmatic pathways upon which you know they're supporting you to make that leap between for between from yourself uh, into society so that really became an important part of um, our inquiry and seeing which organizations did that well finally um, in terms of uh, the numbers, we looked at 53 organizations and uh, we interviewed 10 and we'll share with you th three today. Uh, so we'll have six, or we, have, we have six in the report. Um, yeah, maybe we can shift to the organizations now. So our project, Catherine, would you like to share for a minute or two about that one? Oh yeah, I can share. I noticed my internet connection isn't so good today, so I hope, I hope that you can hear me. Um, so yeah, the Soil Project is um, an organization based in Vietnam, and they're a gap year program, so so targeting kind of university age students, and it's a two to two and a half year program. Thailand, India, across across Asia. Um, and what I find interesting and inspiring about this organization is, is their educational philosophy, which they describe as soil education. And so what they mean by this is that education, and, and so their role as kind of educators and the program is to provide a nourishing foundation for the learners to develop and grow. So a nourishing foundation, a community, and the kind of basic knowledge and, and necessary support and resources. Um, but essentially the point is that, so like soil doesn't direct the shape or, or direction in which a tree grows. And similarly, their role is just to kind of not dictate or direct the growth or development of, of the, the learners, but to support them to kind of unfold and for me, this speaks of how development is is a really a unique journey and a kind of journey of becoming more and more ourselves. Um, and so the other part that I find inspiring about this organization is, is through how they articulate that their aim is to support inner and outer development. And this is really articulated in, in their curriculum, um, which, so they use the, the framework of four H's, the four H's of learning. So heart, hands, head, and healing the world. And so each one of these, these areas has specific practices and skills that they um, focus on. So for instance, heart is about mindfulness, uses nonviolent communication, process work, internal family systems, these kind of practices. Um, hands, things, learning things like natural farming, mud house building, physical skills, head, cultivating the intellect as well, learning about globalization, development, alternative economics and politics. And then healing the world is kind of that bit that Boaz was just talking about, about supporting them to bring their gifts out into the world. So supporting the learners to develop entrepreneurship skills and supporting them to find meaningful livelihood in the world. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about the Soil Project. Wonderful, Catherine. Thank you very much for that. And maybe we can move to the Blue Ridge Rites of Passage. Yeah. Um, so I chose this organization to focus on. Um, and I, well, I guess just like a bit of a background on what they do. It is a six-month program. They have a six-month program, and it's their main program. And it's actually quite a new program. Um, but it's a vision quest process. So it's kind of centered around a vision quest. Uh, which itself is four days, but the initiation process, getting towards the vision quest, they have a lot of kind of coaching methods or kind of practices to kind of coach you through or kind of get you prepared. And then you have the actual rite of passage, which is the vision quest. And then a period afterwards where you can reflect and kind of get a sense for how you develop, what the development was like. Um, but I picked this organization for a few reasons. I think this idea of rites of passage or a rite of passage is really interesting. Um, I think it's a kind of education that we don't really have as much anymore. Um, and this is kind of, maybe we'll talk about this later with this idea of 
ways in which development can be spiritual because they kind of emphasis or they kind of emphasize the spiritual element, particularly. And I think a rite of passage is a way to kind of emphasize a spiritual element because the the whole journey is kind of meant to give you a sense of belonging. And that's kind of what their developmental model is. It's, it's a bit, there's, I think there's like a lot of flexibility, which is nice, but it's, it's kind of focused on this idea of belonging. And for me as well, they, they kind of have a good sense of the state of the world. And that's a good question. What they mean by spiritual assignment. Um, and I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Um, but I think it, it's this sense of belonging to the earth and particularly belonging to the earth in a kind of ecological crisis and how we might develop as human beings in this in this particular crisis or state of the world. Um, so that, that's, yeah, I think that's probably enough. Great, maybe I, I would just, just ask you, uh, Matthew, at this point. So. Um, is there a particular type of practice that you you've come across in the rites of passage where the that the the people participating in there are supported to build that connection to the earth? Is yeah, there... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, right before the vision quest, they have these talks with uh, they they call them like campfire talks where they just uh, have all the participants who are about to go kind of prepare in this. Uh, really open-ended way. Um, I think that was kind of, yeah, one practice that I, that I thought was insightful. I, the, the whole, the vision quest is, is really the main, I guess, practice itself when you're just out there in nature. It's kind of, you do whatever you want for four days in nature. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, but I think the preparation for it and the kind of conversations that they encourage are, are pretty interesting. Great. Super. So uh, a bit of a different focus to the soil project, but um, obviously also connected very much to, to the earth. Um, and finally, we have Deep Springs. Deep Springs is um, a college that uh, was set up in the early 20th century. And um, they are basically emphasizing three aspects. Uh, it's a two-year program, liberal arts program for um, youth. And they're looking to strengthen a sense of academic development. So we all know about that. Um, but the way in which they strengthen academic development is really different because they're looking to have actually a, a student body. And that student body decides with the professors, what will be the, the courses and what will be in the curriculum. So there's a self-organizing dynamic where they're giving a lot of decisional power. Um, and uh, they sometimes can even choose the professors um, that, they, that they're having in the courses. So that's one, one part um, that's obviously a completely different way of thinking about how you study, um, getting them involved, getting them to own the process, um, aside from that, they also have a lot of emphasis around um, working in the field and working on the land. So a strong emphasis on um, manual labor. They do about 20 hours per week, which is pretty big. And they're in this very remote area, um, a very, very remote rural area where they're actually pretty much immersed and not, not ever leaving uh, for the entire period. I mean, there are some holidays, of course. Um, and some emergencies if necessary, but there's a strong emphasis on immersion um, and really enabling people to connect to the land, connect to their, their courses, and then finally also connect to the people. So there's this very strong community aspect where obviously, you know, you think about 15, 20 youth coming together for two years, there's going to be all sorts of problems and issues coming up. Um, and so bringing a sense of awareness, bringing a sense of care and a strong containment around how these uh, conflicts are, are resolved, uh, the ways in which they engage together um, socially throughout this two-year period as they grow um, is also in a very strong, uh, one of what's the third pillar of uh, how they're, in, how they're uh, expected to, to grow and to learn together. Um, 
So there we go. They they use uh, particular linguistics around uh, service and service for a better society. So I thought that that was uh, an interesting term. So it's a term that's maybe even a little bit religious. Um, and um, they talk about the really the students being at the heart of their um, of their their process. So student centered learning and student led learning, which is also an interesting terminology um, and something which is quite rare. I mean, I'd be curious to know if you know of other places that have that type of um, you know, student led uh, academic decision, but I find that quite, quite special. Even in Brockwood School, which Catherine, you researched, um, I mean, there may be younger, so it might be more challenging, but I thought that that was pretty special. So there we go for the three organizations that we've described. Um, this this last, maybe one last note about these springs, they don't still have a very strong uh, emphasis on how they support people to, uh, the, the youth, sorry, to um, tran translate their knowledge into society. Um, but the very way in which they're helping them to build agency um, and organize their schooling hopefully prepares them, but it's more of a, the, the, it doesn't have an explicit framework for how the youth are expected to then translate to society, except to build this capacity around service, which I mentioned. Okay, so we mentioned several of the components here. Maybe we won't um, uh, describe them in much detail right now. You can have a look at them here, but it'd be good to get into a discussion for now. Um, around some of the key aspects that we considered and we uh, uh, got to research in this in this project. Um, so the fact that development was really wide ranging in terms of how pe how the schools considered it, um, not just in terms of the way they defined it, the language that they used for it, but also the type of practices that different organizations have. Um, and so, you know, how wide do we want to have it? Uh, do we do do we do we think it's important to keep it, or perhaps you know there there can be certain um, ways in which we can refine and be more specific. That could be helpful. The immersive component around um, well, what I described, for example, in uh, Deep Springs, but there's other spaces like Ilali, um, the Institute for Life, and Matthew, you remind me what the acronym is, Ilali. Uh, Innovative Living and Learning Institute, Institute for Innovative Living and Learning. Yeah, which is a, a one of the highlight programs from Commonweal, um, where they also have the the youth uh, uh, immersed for a couple of a uh, couple of months, and that enabling, enabling really, that enabling really the intensity of the learning and the ways in which uh, people are able to get to deeper issues inside themselves, developmental issues, attachment issues, relational issues, emotional maybe even traumas and, and, and work through that. Um, you know, like I do a lot of meditation retreats, for example, and the immersive context there also helps to stay with something when it's challenging rather than perhaps, you know, engaging in other spaces or doing other things. Um, mentorship elders, did you want to mention something about that, Matthew? I think that was a particularly strong one for you. Mm, yeah, sure. I, I, Ilali also had a focus on this. Um, and it also kind of reminds me a little bit of rites of passage in a way i think there's i try to be careful with this term but there kind of seems to be like indigenous models of development which are kind of interesting i think and i think there's a little bit less of a focus on elders these days but i think even in the partners for youth model there was a strong emphasis on youth adult partnerships so i think having these kinds of partnerships, whether you call them elders or mentors, whatever they are, seem to be pretty important for development. At least that's yeah. one of the insights from the from the project. Yeah. Great point. Um, and finally, exp expanding where we're, yeah, the, the way in which we consider development is one of the insights we also reflected on a little bit uh, the other day in our last meeting. Um, and the, the, the biggest challenge, I think one of the big takeaways is, um, well, how do you actually, you know, support individuals in a developmental context to start relating to society and, and thinking about society in, in a way that's, um, embodied, 
Uh, you know, you can think about it, you can talk about it, but um, what do you do? You know, that, that's that's one thing that we actually didn't find so much around um, is uh, how they could relate to a larger, larger sense of self uh, in a meaningful way. We didn't find many organizations that could have many practices for that. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. Catherine, Matthew, did you have any final comments, things to add in relationship to this presentation? Or we pass it on to Rufus, maybe for your, your comments first. Yeah, Rufus can go ahead. Yeah, for sure. Or I, so, I want to start by setting some exciting context for the, the project. And I think there's also, I put a couple of links in the chat, including I think the most the first one, which is maybe the most important, which is to uh, about what are deliberately developmental spaces. So I think there's kind of a, a maybe a kind of context here is that obviously there have been spaces or you know living environments or schools or other institutions, clearly development happens. <laughs> Right. If your children learn things, uh, people get more skilled uh, physically, cognitively, indirectly, emotionally. So one thing to kind of reflect on is what it, what do we mean by why this term deliberately developmental spaces? What are we looking at? And one aspect of that is to try and distinguish a bit what is distinctive or different or more than or complementary to all of these existing spaces in which you know, humans are always, in, well, we hope, often growing or evolving in some way. And the other is why we think that's really important. I mean, so first I wanna to come to the distinction because I think that's, we don't have an answer to that, we're kind of feeling into that. And so one way you could even look is if you're interested in communities or intentional communities or co-living or conscious co-living, well, it is true that within many of those spaces, people that when you live with others, you often have to engage in, well, you have to engage maybe in some degree of uh, self uh, transformation or personal development. It's often not maybe a very explicit or conscious part of uh, what is happening in those places. Um, even say, I'd say like a leading part of maybe intentional community space, like eco villages or things like that, what they what is kind of central is is maybe the ecological part or the sustainable part, which is hugely important and really interesting. And it is also true that many communities necessarily, if they are to survive, tend to innovate. They tend to have to encounter how do they deal with conflict, how do people uh, grow, how does the collective grow in order to manage it. And you know there are even kind of famous, if you like, innovations like there's the Zeg Forum, which is this kind of way of dealing with collective, you know. Well, collective or interpersonal dynamics or conflicts or things like that. The point that we're getting at though by coming up with this term deliberately developmental spaces was to think of spaces where that ontological development or that personal development is actually central and kind of conscious or deliberate, which echoes the point about deliberately developmental organizations, Keegan's term and, and his colleague, Keegan and his colleague's term. So that, that's kind of just to take one area where you could think of, okay, there are intentional communities, but which are deliberately developmental or deliberately developmental spaces, which are intentional communities. Where that, you know, that, now one obviously example traditionally has been, you might say monasteries or, you know, Buddhist monasteries or maybe even Christian monasteries or others. They would maybe fit that because obviously you were trying to spiritually or ontologically develop in this major way. And that's why you're going to do lots of meditation or other things. And similarly, to take the other end of some of the examples we've had today, which is educational institutions. Um, obviously, education institutions are aiming to help people develop in some dimensions. Uh, why, for example, did we put, um, uh, sorry, what's the name of the college? Well, we've got, uh, what was the? Deep Springs. Deep Springs and all we've got um, Rockwood Park. Now, what distinguishes Blue Springs if anything, this is part of the thing we're in dialogue around in this project from Harvard, um, which while we think Harvard's amazing, we don't think probably Harvard is a deliberately developmental space per se. Well, of course, people do grow up and mature in huge ways, possibly going to Harvard or going to any other 
college. And so that's part of the inquiry. And if you go and read their website, I mean, we illustrate, we talked a little today, but you know, it's found on quite maybe a quite a different ethos, an ethos around self-government, around actually having to work in, in kind of in a certain way and intentionally a certain degree of friction, like you're isolated, but they have these kind of fairly strict rules about you don't you can't really leave the college while you're there. You're kind of isolated on this farm. I think to be form this kind of self, self-managing, self kind of authoring, you might say, community. So first of all, just to kind of reiterate, there's this purpose of this exercise is to try and distinguish a new, well, not distinguish, but give name to something which may already be there, but make explicit is this concept of spaces which are dedicated to and self-consciously dedicated to ontological development in the sense of, I think here, not simply like your math skills, but your inner development, your emotional a self-regulation and, and self-awareness, your you might say your your ego development, your consciousness development in a broader sense, and perhaps even the transcendence of self-development, the transcendence of the self. Um, you know, it's, uh, I only laugh because often we talk about self-development, but the greatest self-development might involve going beyond the self. The second question I just want to touch on briefly is why do we think this is so interesting and important at this moment in the time between worlds or the era, as we like to say, of the second renaissance? Well, because these capacities were always important to humanity and to human societies in some degree, I think are massively more important at this moment. Um, for a variety of, of reasons. Um, I think the most is that we are having to cope with conf complexity and conflict that is unprecedented in a sense. Um, and I, that, I don't mean conflict maybe even, I mean conflict in ideas, in, in different ways of making sense of the world that really requires a different, a often different level of capacity to hold um, and integrate those ideas and to manage in the face of the growing crises that we are confronting. Um, there's a level of kind of emotional resiliency, but also kind of political complexity, resiliency and so on. So that's why we think this is both an urgent and actually fascinating uh, urgent project in the sense that we need more deliberately developmental spaces. Uh, I think urgently given what we are dealing with. And secondly, because that this is also a kind of trying to distinguish something maybe that is already there, but draw out and, and, and help kind of come into being a field and a movement around these ideas. And with that, I think we should open the floor for, for comments and discussions. And Simon, I see, has already raised his hand. And lastly, there's actually a special treat for people. Just my last point, I should mention the call. There is exclusive, I think, to school, the opening of our of our of our manifesto, which has been drafted, which people can sign on to if you're interested, developmental space door, which says more about this. But it's the launch of the manifesto informally. It's in draft form, and you will be one of the first people to have access to it. And um, we're going to be launching it properly next week. So Simon, over to you and over to Boaz. Yeah, just to say about the manifesto, you can you can also sign on to it if you feel right. like you're you you can you abide by that or you'd like to support it. Um, then do feel free to sign on to it. Uh, you can also send us your suggestions. You can send it over to other partners or individuals. Um, you know, we're looking to, to be able to make this as widely accepted as possible. And maybe that requires some adaptations. So your feedback is also welcome. Yeah. Simon. I'd like, to, I'd like to start by throwing in the real curveball, which is like, how much have you considered this sort of duality between seeing development i mean like i think you have actually it's already been implicit in, in some of the things which have come up uh seeing deliberately developmental i mean the first idea that pops into mind for deliberately developmental is i've got an agenda i want you to develop in this way and i'm going to be deliberate about that and that's where i put in the only half only half joking uh, reference to slytherin and and gryffindor because i suspect that the models of development would be slightly different in an interesting way um but there is another possibility, which I think you have touched on, which is uh, we want to um, deliberately 
provide for development did the, the what the, what was that soil um the the soil whatever soil project um yeah um and you know in the sense of deliberately providing a space where people can develop in a very idiosyncratic way develop their own potential which is very much sort of i would i would call it keegan's you know fourth order consciousness you know like very much yeah very much fourth order consciousness and i think that's really probably given that you given we're talking about keegan and we're talking about that age grain age range we are i guess talking about third to fourth order consciousness development rather than fifth order consciousness which is interesting because he or he says that it comes later mm -hmm. yeah okay um so yeah so basically that one um another point i'll just very quickly throw in peckham i keep on coming back to peckham experiment um mutual synthesis of health definition of health mutual synthesis of organism and environment which is a really good sort of pointer to where we're trying to get to we're trying to get to a state we're trying to see to develop a an ecosystem where the parts and the whole are developing mutually and that at every level to the frankly level That means I'm shutting up. I closed my mic. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, I don't know enough about uh, Harry Potter to respond. So maybe I, I can answer a bit, like if you want. Yeah, please. But then to to recreate the question, I think so. One thing that's uh, so one just to answer the immediate first question, which is there isn't for delivery developmental space in this in the, there isn't have to be one map or model of what we think cultivating being or inner development is the point would be though that people had some conception of that and and kind of made that was held somewhat consciously by the, the community uh, so just just to say you're right the slytherin or metaphorically slytherin or um you know gryffindor could have different conceptions of what uh healthy human development was or healthy the, the pathways of yeah, what the objective what what the objective is you know and i'm sure that's yeah. like you know guilds yeah. guilds and you know um guilds and apprentices you develop as a something other you know right you develop as a monk you know you develop as a architect yeah. you develop as a something you know and that has a that has its own agenda on it yeah you develop as a renaissance man i mean i don't know so it's what I'm saying is we, we're not coming and saying what that, that you know, which pathway is a right pathway or a wrong pathway in that sense. The, the, the definition of dental space in this investigation is quite open-ended. What it's looking for, though, is that all, maybe um, experiments or, or projects or existing efforts that have got a, a, a kind of maybe a self-consciously self have a conception of this kind of type of development and i think the other point is to say it is something that's distinct from classically like oh i'm gonna learn maths or you know even you know you're gonna you know men's cat sana and corpora sana uh, i think um yeah in corpora sana you know the idea that you would physically you know you play sports at school and you you learn maths you know there's multiple multi-dimensional development in traditional education but it doesn't include often at least explicitly or self-consciously what we you might say is either emotional and consciousness or ego development. So this, just to say on, on that point, I think that that's, that's correct. That, and, and I think that's something at the moment we want to hold, which is there we're open to many different views or pathways or endpoints that people are seeking. I think there's over time, I think there might be some kind of, well, there isn't like one, I think there can be a debate about like healthier or less healthy ones, you know, like if you know, this, this plan is about developing you as like some, you know, I don't know, so, you know, uncaring, unempathetic psychopath, that wouldn't be so, so useful. Um, but yeah, I want to come to other questions. I think Mitra uh, has that's, her hand up. That's, that's, that's Slytherin, that, that's Slytherin for you. Yes, go. <laughs> sure, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for sharing about these wonderful organizations. Um, I'm, I'm just curious about the research methodology. How did you go about finding the organizations and once you identified one, how did you structure the research inquiry? Let's see. I could share a bit. I mean, I mean, Bas also. I mean, I mean, to to say this is also like I think I posted the the 
link in the chat to the background for this project, which is preliminary. Uh, it's the hope of the beginning of something. So it was somewhat snowball sampling. We were limited also. We have some organizations you can see outside of like North America and Europe, or in fact, the Nordics. And it's mostly North American. We just had a very, you know, so we went basically initially on some examples or people to speak to who then gave us suggestions. So it was a snowball sample initially and some desk research. And we, we would love more examples. For example, if you have suggestions, please, please let us know. And we do we have a kind of plan capacity um, permitting to kind of every, put everything online and allow it to be contributed to the kind of list that we first created. We might add it to developmental spaces to org the site for the manifesto and so on. But the basic answer is it was recommendations from, you know, we did, and something actually you just prompted me to say, this is a project done in association with Fetzer, the Fetzer Foundation, uh, Thomas Bjorkman at Excret and uh, Orange Schlossberg at Commonweal. So we have these wonderful partners and we, we've been doing most of the actual kind of research in life itself, but this is a project created with them and which they're heavily involved in. And they helped suggest names as well and, and so on. So that was how we went about it in terms of finding. And then in terms of the inquiry, I don't know if you guys want to say more. I mean, there were in-depth interviews with some, but yeah, feel free to say more. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you mentioned it. So we first had an initial group of contacts through these four organizations that are connected and part of this project. And then we snowball sampled. Um, and then we did some additional desk research and um, we basically looked for, you know, certain um, basic information around like the year, the, the year funded, the number of people, the population target, the age range, uh, the location. Um, we looked at the specific values they had, the, the programs that they had, the practices within those programs. And then we had this threefold criteria in terms of assessing what we, how we define developmentalism. Our development deliberately developmental approach, um, and some of the ones that you're seeing that we saw that we shared with you tonight ranked higher according to how we considered it, um, and those included those three questions around um, the multidisciplinarity, including a strong focus on inner development. The second part around the relationship to society, and then the scaffolding of how they were actively practically supporting people to make those uh, steps towards society. So that's how we went about it. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Mitra? Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, emphasize. We'd love, we'd love to do more and, and to find more, many more organizations. So if you know of any, or if you want to get more involved in the project, also maybe we can put someone's email in the in the chat and you can please be in contact if you want to uh, email. I'll, I'll, I'll put um, mm -hmm. yeah, the team. Matthew, you guys had a comment? Uh, yeah, just a quick comment uh, based off what Simon said. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting how like each time we have, we've had a lot of these conversations, but it's like each time something new kind of pops up. Um, and the thing that just kind of popped up for me is uh, maybe thinking about this idea of affordances as it relates to deliberately developmental spaces. Because each DDS kind of has its own set of affordances, affordances, sorry, which is kind of also embedded in larger kinds of affordances which and it's a lot of our development happens through affordances i would probably argue or i would suggest but i think i think affordances is one of the things we haven't discussed but i think it might be interesting to to talk about or, or think about further so could you say a bit more what does that look like in terms of one of the organizations and the type of affordances that they're proposing and how that fits into the wider societal affordances yeah good question i think city year might be a good example how they're mm -hmm. they particularly want you to get more involved in a community. Um, and that's not really to, I guess, continue to use the term. It's not really an affordance that happens too much in our world. Like you don't have to get integrated in your community. Um, you could, if you wanted to, I mean, I think it's like community service, which is, is not all, it's not necessarily uncommon, but it's, it's not that common either, but I think they provide a kind of affordance, which, most people or it's not widespread throughout i guess yeah yeah it's not deliberately part of, of the structure right, right, right yeah right. and and so how city year then embeds the individual within the community that they're working with then also creates a mindset 
so that when they finish their nine month program, they then think as well in terms of whichever community that they'd be integrating to have that kind of multi-level approach. So that is true that City Year was one of the strongest in terms of uh, that latter practical engagement of um, how they were linking the personal to societal. I'm aware we're coming yeah, up for time, but time. I'm, if there's any last questions, Christina or Les or Mitra or Lisa, uh, yeah. And any reactions as well? Like, the, and we're, how, how are you, how was this for you to, to notice this? Any particular insights, any uh, surprises, any disagreements? It's all welcome. Oh, thanks. That's, um, I, you know, maybe as Lisa said in the chat, it's very, very interesting. Um, and I read the manifesto um, quite closely. Um, there are so many elements that you are bringing together and um, like making a, an objective, an objective of many uh, purposes which organisations would agree with, but you you are making them paramount and. Um, and making them making them available in one space. So as a kind of, I don't know, as an experiment or an illustration, it is very interesting. Um, I've just dropped into the call and I really appreciate the sincerity and the wisdom that you're you're sharing and building. In my experience, I'm in inner city London um, and I'm working with communities in the area in which I live, I find that I share and reflect many of the the strands that you're talking about. But I, if I were to make them explicit, um, I would lose my credibility very quickly. Right. And for yes. me, it's a blend of of what you're you're alluding to. You're making objective. Um, I, I kind of play and in conversational terms discuss with residents on a what we call a social housing estate the same concepts but i have to use a, a very different vocabulary so so i'm really curious what kind of vocabulary do you use les i mean as for me it's a very very important point you're making i i <laughs> it's interesting i should go and write my dictionary so i guess it's what we would call the vernacular the, the, the common parlance terms, the common terms that 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 people can jump and, and understand. I, I can't be any more specific. Than yeah. That. So talking about, so rather than like social emotional intelligence, we just talk about like you know being able to, to be with anger or just like really yeah, making. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Like I, I can use yeah. the be in the moment and yeah. and what emerges. I mean, I can talk to residents about what what emerges for me. And I know they've never heard that expression before, what emerges for me. And 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 I reflect on things. And and like folk on who I talk to kind of, you know, they've, they've never heard this kind of language before. So it kind of sure. they're comfortable with it. So and so I'm introducing many of the concepts that you're you're really exploring and pushing the boundaries, which is why I respect what you're doing. Um, so but that it uh, inspires me and encourages me, but I, I can't actually add much more yeah. to what you're doing. Thank you for sharing those reflections, Les. It's really wonderful Thank to you. hear you. It's, and it, that's, I think it's a really key point that you're making. That's also an insight for us, you know, in relationship to um, how to think more broadly around development and making it accessible. Well, yeah. also, well isn't that the was... contradiction that you have to focus so much to kind of do, to to move on that you have to yeah. lose the 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 outside, you know, the sort of the the mass. Yeah. So it's a contradiction yeah. that I'm sure we're all working yeah. with because I want to go I want to go um, global on the work I do, yes. so it, it's sort of, it's interesting. And it's great also, Simon, we bumped into each other, I think over a long time ago. I don't know where it was, maybe community currency or some, some something interesting. Um, so it's good to see you, Simon. And if you don't mind, uh, ladies you and gentlemen, gotta, I'm gonna thank, No, on. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Christina, well, thank you. Just... It's really appreciated. And I'll, 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 I'll sign up to your emails or whatever it is and, um, maybe bounce into another call sometime.
And maybe even on the manifesto, Les. We're counting on you. Well, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. It's more than my job. Okay, you can think about it. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, okay, then. Will do. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And Christina, any final reflections from you before we close? Any uh, more, more than I could possibly share in the time allotted. So I think that's actually the reflection. Yeah. It's that this has opened up, you know, a can of worms, as we sometimes say. Um, and I, or maybe Pandora's box, who knows, but I, I certainly, uh, think it, it, that what, you know, you've shared here warrants, um, you know, a, a, a plethora of time, uh, that we could, you know, share together in the future, uh, to dig into some of the, the nuances. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Christina. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And so we'll wrap it up then, friends. Uh, thank you very much. Also, Matthew and Catherine for your great contributions, both in the project, of course, and also tonight. And uh, we'll see each other very soon. Yeah. Lots of love. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you very much. Lovely. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you, Good to see you. Bye-bye. Great. See ya. Bye-bye.